welcome to some sports. Um, thanks ever so much, Professor Lauren Callister, for coming to talk to us today. Um, I think we're going to have to stand over here. I'm the Director of Sex Education, Sarah Lethbridge, usually found on the top floor of this building. So thanks for having a room change today, but we've actually got one of our courses running. If you're interested in any of the short courses that the business school offer, then please come and talk to me and we'll be happy to help. Um, in terms of the next breakfast briefings, um, an exciting one with Daryl Mann, a leading um, expert in innovation, talking about the Magnificent Seven, all the Googles and all the tech companies, and um, what they're doing in terms of shaping the insurance industry. Um, also, on yeah, tomorrow night, we're host, hosting a cheese and wine event, information evening, about our fantastic executive MBA offer. So again, if anyone's interested in an executive MBA, then tomorrow night might be a good time to come and find out more about the programme. Um, very happy Fiona's in the building. There you are, Fiona. Um, we're going to look at homelessness, a um, really critical issue, particularly in Wales, that we have to think about and we'll talk about our work with Shlamai at that event. Uh, Professor Max Monday, Water and its Value to Wales, Thursday 2nd of May. And then we're excited to have a sort of month of creativity in June, uh, working with the Creative Cardiff team, finding out more about their um, big European project and how they're going to help the creative industries of South Wales. Um, and then hopefully we're just starting to shape um, a July event about the Metro project. So we're really excited that actually we've got a great forward plan and visibility of the activities over the next couple of years. So we'd love you to come um, and share this event with your friends. Because it's really important to the business school to be open and accessible to business. So our breakfast briefing will be recorded and live streamed. Um, not sure how many people are viewing out there. I know Professor Calvin Jones is from his <laughs> <laughs> abode. So hi Calvin. Um, and so please can you wait for um, the microphone when there's questions and answer sessions at the end. And now actually it's delightful. I love it when there's a chair. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Clive Grace, who's an honorary research fellow at the school, who's going to be chairing this event for us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, good morning. Um, as Sarah said, I'm a, an honorary research fellow here. My interests are making public services change and improvement and, and issues in corporate governance. So uh, it's uh, a special delight to be uh, chairing this uh, event uh, this morning. Our topic is, uh, is governance and sport. And that really sits as a topic at the confluence of three major forces. Um, the first is the, the growing importance of governance in all aspects of social and economic life. As people become more concerned with effective leadership, with accountability, with standards of conduct and ethics, um, and we see this uh, right across the public realm and also in, in the private sector. The second uh, of these major forces is the, the importance of sport in the psyche, the culture, the passion of Wales, um, its importance to the people and communities of Wales and to their health and well-being. And the third uh, aspect is the extent to which um, issues and policies to do with governance and sport and many other aspects of uh, social and economic life are increasingly determined in <coughs> Wales, by Wales, and with Wales' specific interests and needs in mind. So our topic sits somewhere where those three major forces um, coincide and come together. <coughs> we couldn't really have anybody uh, better than uh, Professor Laura McAllister, who's Professor of uh, Public Policy and Governance um, at the, uh, and the Governance of Wales at the, <coughs> the Wales Governance Centre. She's got uh, extraordinary experience in sport administration and leadership, um, as well as, of course, her um, extensive <coughs> academic and research expertise. She'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A. Um, and so, Laura, over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, I think I've got, got, got a mic up already. Um, Borada, uh, thank you very much indeed for, for inviting me to talk to you this morning. It's a real pleasure. Thank you to everyone for coming out on this cold, uh, crispy morning. 
Um, it, it is a real pleasure to talk about two areas that are very, very close to my heart, and it's a kind of happy and serendipitous coincidence of the two things that dominate my thinking from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. I have to say sport more than feminine, in the truth. <laughs> but um, genuinely, it's, it's great to be able to bring those two things together in terms of some of the work that, that I currently do, both here in the university and externally. But I will say, as I'll point out to you in a moment, that I'm in, also in that happy situation at the moment of holding no major public external roles in sport. Um, I say happy because that means I would say what I like these days rather than <laughs> coded by uh, uh, the conventions that I used previously. Um, I, would, I always think there are two ways to approach these talks. I might not use the whole 45 minutes, I think, because I'd like to hear your views on, on what I say, but there are two ways of approaching these talks. is either um, to rehearse the kind of dense procedural codes and frameworks and structures and processes around sports governance, um, or um, a slightly lighter direction um, where I talk about um, my own journey through those frameworks, codes, structures, processes. Um, and I'll try and throw in, I'm going to offer the latter, you can please to, to know, and I'm going to try and throw in some real live illustrations and some anecdotes and some of my own experience, which I hope will <coughs> exemplify some of the bigger points that I'm making about sports governance and how it works in practice rather than in theory. Because all of you here um, in your own organisations will know that there's a big chasm between practice and theory, whatever anybody tells you, especially academics. We're the worst people to listen to on that, by the way. Um, so th it's a very labyrinthine world, the world of sports <coughs> governance, but in some senses it's very simple as well. Um, uh, and, and forgive me in advance for, for using a fairly light-hearted approach <coughs> to some of this, but um, I'm even going to use some photographic evidence of how progress has been made in, in sports governance. Some pictures of a very young me, by the way, would be fairly easy to recognise. But I think that's quite important because it will help you understand some of the more trenchant points that I'm trying to make. Um, I think you'll... Uh, you, when I was thinking about this presentation generally, um, I was thinking about uh, the words of a colleague of mine um, who said to me once, um, this was in the context of a, a board governance workshop, um, I didn't expect there to be so much of the boring stuff that has nothing to do with sport. I came onto this board to do sport. Um, and there it probably lies one of the biggest problems. I think if, if governance is seen as an adjunct, as a bolt-on, as that kind of any other business item on the meeting agenda, right at the end usually, when everybody's really tired and looking at their watches, um, planning their journeys home, and so to speak, then I think it constitutes a real organisational risk that will probably prove fatal to that organisation. Um, and, and just a word as well about um, the, the title that I'm using for this. Can I go back? Yes, am I allowed to use the title that I'm using for this talk, um, No Surprises Bar the Ambition. That comes from a, a, a mentor of mine who gave me some really good advice about which boards she chose to serve on. Uh, she'd been a non-exec on several boards, charitable, public, private, some sports, some not. But she used this um, principle of um, no surprises and lots of ambition. And I think that's a really, I think that's a really important principle because when you're working within a, a board, you don't want to be surprised by anything the board's doing or by its governance code and so on. Um, but equally, you want that board to have a real <coughs> inner core of ambition and aspiration about everything that it is doing. Okay. I think you probably know that I've held or have or currently hold several quite significant leadership roles in sport and in academia and politics, but particularly in sport. Um, I'm going to talk about some of those, but an important caveat is that I won't actually name the organisations that I'm referring to when I use some of the illustrations. You'll get my point here. Um, it would probably be discourteous to some of those when I'm being critical, and I'd probably be overplaying some of the successes of other organisations if I did. Um, but given that I've been on several boards, and those are a reflection of the, the organisations that I'm working with at the moment, I'll tell you more about UEFA and FIFA in, in a second. Um, 
I think you can probably piece together as I'm talking which ones I'm referring to, but um, you can make a guess as to which those organisations are, and that's fine, but the point is you never quite know whether you're right in making those guesses. Um, you know I've been Chair of Sport Wales, <coughs> and I'm a board member of UK Sport, which is the uh, UK's organisation that oversees Paralympic and Olympic sport. I had two terms there, actually. A first term as an independent uh, member appointed by DCMS, and then a second term, from 2010 to 2016, whilst I was Chair of Sport Wales. So then very much representing um, Welsh Sport on UK Sport Board. Um, I have to say, and I've said this publicly anyway, so I will say this um, in this environment, I was very disappointed with the culture of the uh, board at UK Sport. Um, not because it wasn't a very high performing organisation, it was. It clearly met all of the very significant medal targets that were set for it, albeit with a very, very healthy sum of public money behind it. But for me, there wasn't a sufficient culture of uh, healthy friction in terms of how the board culture operated. And I'll say a little bit about this as we go along. I, th I always think a healthy board is one that is very open to challenge, that isn't a comfortable place to be, and that really has that kind of edginess and friction around it, so that uh, the people who are board members will, will listen to very different um, discussions and very different arguments about um, their subject areas. Um, the, the only roles I currently hold in sport actually are in, are in football, so I'm, I'm Deputy Chair of the UEFA Women's Football Committee, which is obviously something very close to my heart, I haven't been a player myself. Um, I'm, re I'm really enjoying that role and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the strategic work that we do um, there. Um, the reason I put up FIFA candidate failed is that some of you will know that, that I, I, I was a candidate for FIFA Council two years ago um, last summer. Um, and um, I don't know whether it constitutes a failure. I mean, let's just say I was disqualified from standing on the basis of a very old um, precedent, which is the British associations. I don't know how much you all know about football governments, but uh, we're effectively independent football nations within Britain. So we're, the Welsh FA is completely independent of the English FA and the Scottish FA. But there's a, an old precedent that um, the British associations have a designated vice president on FIFA Council. So one of the associations will hold that. Traditionally, it's been held by England, no surprises there, um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, and my candidature for the FIFA Council from another British association was deemed to be unconstitutional because of the protected place that we already had on FIFA Council. So I didn't actually lose any election, I was just uh, encouraged to withdraw my candidacy at a, um, a fairly uh, late stage in the process. What's interesting about all of that though, I think, and, and let's hope it's not forever, you know, there'll be other opportunities I hope to do some work at that kind of multi-level, uh, uh, multinational basis. But what's interesting about all of that is the potential that we have in Wales to be big players on the governance stage. Um, <coughs> football in particular, because um, our reputation is strong. I know some people here from the, from the FAW, but our reputation is strong, particularly as a small to medium-sized association. Um, uh, I'll, I'll mention the, the um, European Championships a bit later on, but the fact that we've done so well in the development of the game and the elite side gives us quite a lot of um, kudos in, in those circles. Okay, I'm going to leap on from this one because I want to, um, I want to say a little bit about um, my background and where I've learned some of the important professional lessons. Um, and I guess a university is probably not the best place to make this confession, but um, <laughs> it is my own reality. Um, a word on sport first and why it's so important. Um, it's, I've said this quite a few times, including in my um, Western Mail column, that sport is important because it isn't important. And that sounds like a weird contradiction, but if you have a think about it, if you watch sport, I'm sure all of you in this room are sports fans. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big Cardiff City fan. I'm still optimistic about 17th place, by the way. Um, but if you, watch, if you watch sport, or if you just have fun playing, or even if you play at an uh, at a elite level, um, it can be a real arena for extremes, can't it? For that kind of extreme joy and celebration that you have when things go well, your team's winning, you've played a fabulous squash or tennis game, or you've won your five-side match against your work rivals. That's wonderful, but it's also a, an arena for that kind of awful, distraught devastation when things don't go well. And you see that with children, don't you? Any of you with kids here know how they take defeat so seriously. And that's okay. Because in some respects, sport isn't a matter of life and death, despite what famous football managers have said in the past. But what sport is, 
is a very unique phenomenon, particularly to small countries like, like Wales and, and indeed countries like, like New Zealand as well. And I think that's because sport matters so much because it has a very special place in our national psyche and our consciousness. It helps define us as a nation. And I think small nations particularly find that. Um, we haven't got that much by way of unique USP that is globally known in Wales, uh, if you think about it. People, what do people know Wales for? They know us for some of the kind of historical artefacts like coal mines, singing, all of those things, which are out of date now in, in obvious ways. But they also know us globally for sport. They know us as a really small nation that punches above its weight on the um, international stage. Um, and I think that can be a really important global USP. I mean, for me, sport could actually fill a really important gap particularly after Brexit, in terms of how we trade with the rest of the world. Um, there's a real opportunity to use the leverage of sport to get into important trade deals across the world, and to, sell some, to use some of our great sports stars as platforms to um, show what a young and attractive country Wales can be. But of course, it's not just about that glamorous bit of sport. Um, and I'm going to put up a slide next which will tell you how my own journey through sports governance changed in terms of perspective. Because yes, sport can be a really important economic phenomenon, it can be about economic prospects and so on, but if you think about the health relationship that sport has, as long as there is a staggering 12% of young people in Wales, and that's four and five year olds by the way, who are obese, as long as type 2 diabetes is continuing to prol proliferate in Wales, then the relationship between sport and physical activity, of course, sport in its broader sense, um, and the public purse is a very, very important one. And nothing frustrates me more, and I'm allowed to say this now, than having a government which likes the baubles of sport, the great occasions when we host the Champions League, or when we host the Rugby World Cup or, Cup or an Ashes, um, test or the Ryder Cup or whatever it, it is, um, uh, nothing frustrates me more than political ministers who stand before cameras and take the plaudits from events, but then in the next breath take an axe to sports funding which cuts the very grassroots, which cuts sport off at its knees basically. I think we've got to <coughs> sell the case for the cradle to grave provision of sport effectively. And if we don't do that, we're not actually governing sports well. So you'll see the connection with um, what I'm saying here. Um, but that sort of soft power of sport is quite an important one. I mean, I mentioned Wales at the Football Euros in 2016. Um, and just before the uh, European Championships, I gave a lecture at the Hay Festival. Some of you might remember it because it caused a little bit of a stir because I said in that that it was the Patrick Hannan Memorial Lecture. And I said in that that it would be more significant for us as a nation if Wales qualified for the Euros, never mind got to the semi-finals, which is of course what we did do, than it would be if Wales won the Rugby World Cup. Well, anyone who knows anything about sport and rivalries and the <coughs> culture of sport in Wales will know that that's rare, reputable stuff. But, but you know, I stand by that. And in fact, if anything, I think we were proved right really by what, what happened in the Euros in France where you know, not only did we get to the semi-final, we won the goal of the tournament, we had two players in the team of the tournament, Chris Coleman was lauded as one of the best coaches in the world. What's happened to Chris now, of course, is not a great story, but, um, but more importantly, our fans were regarded as great ambassadors for the nation, enjoying all the joys of the great French cities. Um, but, but what that showed to us, really, was the global reach of certain sports. I mean, football is huge, huge business. Um, the European football market is worth over 25 billion euros. Nearly every country in the world plays football. So you go to a country in Africa or Asia and they know who Gareth Bale is and they know he's Welsh. And that's what I'm talking about when I mention soft power. It's about reach, it's about extent of reach, it's about that incredible um, USP. But, but you know, that, that's one thing. And we can talk about a whole host of fabulous. Um, platforms that sport have had. The Commonwealth Games <coughs> last year when Wales won 36 medals, been to an audience of, I think it was 1.5 billion worldwide. Um, Cardiff, the city success last year when the Cardiff Devils did so well, Cardiff Blues and Cardiff City got promotion. That tells the world something about how modern and young and dynamic the city of Cardiff is. But as well as all of that, um, there's some more important lessons that I've learned um, from sport, which I think 
are things that are really pivotal to governance. So let me just rehearse a couple of them before I take you through that sort of governance journey. Now, when people talk about life lessons from sport, they almost invariably say things like self-discipline, teamwork, goal setting, and so on. Well, I'm, that's not really what I mean. What I mean is a slightly different take on that. Um, it's how to manage passion. This is really important in sport because all of us who work in sport have an incredible passion for what we're doing. But you know, passion sometimes and enthusiasm can be a bit of a poison chalice. But what I mean by that is we mustn't be blinded or blinkered by our enthusiasm for what we do. Sometimes sport needs a really cold analysis and critical challenge. And sometimes you can't do that if you care too much about it. You see what I'm getting at here? If we don't have governing bodies, um, boards of governing bodies, and people who run sport, whether that's Sport Wales, in the Welsh Government, in clubs, in every platform, who can offer that kind of cold, critical analysis on how the sport is run, then we'll be, we'll be blinded by our admittedly positive energy and enthusiasm for what we're doing. So we can't have sport run entirely by people who are from that sporting background. That is a recipe for tripping yourself up further down the line. So that's one of the lessons that I've learned very, very clearly. A um, good example from that is one board member that I've worked with said to me when I talked about the need to have shorter terms of office for board members so that they didn't serve um, ad infinitum on boards and even possibly having age limits or age caps, which is something that the Football Association of Wales has, has introduced um, in the last governance review. Um, when I talked about that with some of my colleagues on one board, um, the response was, ah, well, we'll never find another one like John, our current chair. Mm -hmm. And I refrained from saying, well, yes, that's the point. <laughs> and that's the way, that is the criticism of, of the chair. <coughs> Organisations need renewal. Organisations need difference. They need to move to a different climate with a different set of personnel, depending on the circumstances they're in. If the mindset is, look, we've got somebody here who's given his heart and soul to this role, and it tends to be a he, and we'll talk about that later, um, then that's fine, but they will reach an end of their contribution. We all need to know when to finish. A um, really important principle in anything we do, and um, we all have a shelf life. A professional athlete will know that he or she will finish in uh, probably their early 30s, but that's their body telling them. It's much harder to get your mind to tell you when is the appropriate time uh, to finish in, the, in a role that you love at the end of the day. <coughs> now this one is just to give you a bit of a flavour of how my own perception of sports governance has changed. Because when I started, and when I got involved first of all with UK Sport, and indeed with um, uh, Sport Wales, my interest was really in the competitive end. You know, I played at uh, elite level myself, so I was interested in how to help create a high performance environment for our top athletes. But if you asked me at the end of my time as Chair of Sport Wales what motivated me more, then I would definitely say it was absolutely the earliest interventions for children into sport. Because anybody here who's got children will know that there are significant problems in the provision of children's sport. Um, school sport is by no means doing its best to integrate girls <coughs> and boys and make them skilled for taking part in sport outside the uh, outside the school environment. We know that PE is not given the status that it should have. We know that there's a shortage of both time, resource and energy given to the subject, um, which I think, quite frankly, is scandalous. Um, I served on a task and finish group with uh, Baroness Tanda Gray Thompson, I think probably five or six years ago now, which reported back to the Welsh Government with a really simple recommendation that the status of PE should change in schools so that it had the same status as, as maths, English, Welsh, and science. So that the physical health of our young people was put at the very heart of the curriculum. Now, I don't think that's controversial in the slightest, because you, you show me a child who is morbidly obese and inactive and tell me that they can achieve as many um, life opportunities as a child who is physically active and healthy. So this is really very, very fundamental. But what's frustrating me more is that we make such limited progress on this agenda. Despite Tammy's report saying very categorically, make PE a core compulsory subject that is reviewed and inspected by ESTIN, that the time around it is protected, the teachers are trained to deliver it properly, because you <coughs> ask any teacher, especially in primary <coughs> school, and they'll tell you they are lacking confidence to deliver PE well. 
If we change all of that, then we change the health of our nation. And that's why, for me, my own journey through sports governance moved from focus on the elite, although I, I'm still very motivated by that, to something much more uh, entrenched in um, grassroots opportunities. Let me deal with um, a couple of the... Um, no, sorry, let me, let me tell you what, I, what, what sort of creates a framework for, for, um, uh, uh, for any consideration of, of sports governance first. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. Um, for me, it's about all of these principles in different components and at different times. Um, if you go back to the frameworks that we have for, um, if you go back to the frameworks that we have, sorry, um, this doesn't seem to be going back. Hang on, hold on, hold on. If you go back to the existing frameworks that we have for sport in Wales and the UK, um, this, is, this is the governance and leadership framework for Wales, um, which was set up originally whilst I was chair of Sport Wales, actually. Um, and I'm really pleased to see how much progress has been made on that subsequently. Um, it was a really important start of cultural change around the governance of sport. No more, a start. And I, I appreciate that there's a long way to go in this journey as well. But what pleased me more than anything about that um, framework for governance was that it was designed by and for the sports sector, led by some of the pioneering NGBs. I know gymnastics, cycling, football were all involved. Really important that they were taking on the responsibility for modernising um, and protecting sport themselves. Um, I think at the time Sport Wales' stated aim was to maximise resource through well-run, well-led organisations that are best prepared to achieve their potential. Two really important words there, resource, because as you, know, as you probably know, most sport in Wales is publicly funded. And I'll come on to those principles I put up a moment ago. We have huge accountability responsibilities, <coughs> excuse me, as long as sport is publicly funded. But equally, potential, back to my title really, of course it's about avoiding risk, of course it's about due diligence and making sure you don't waste public money, but it's also about having the ambition for sport to propel us to the next level. We can't be happy with where we are um, currently. And of course, all of this has to be organic and live. And those in the room who are currently working on uh, in the sports sector will know that a whole host of new topics have emerged um, in recent times, which have put a heavy demand on how sport is governed. If you think about things like duty of care to athletes, um, on the back of quite a few significant scandals, actually, in sport. If you think about harassment and bullying, if you think about anti-doping, um, it, it's not so long ago that Russia's athletes were banned from competition in the Olympic Games because of state-sponsored doping. Um, if you think about things like new commercial strategies, new regulatory frameworks such, such as uh, uh, GPDR, if you think about what has happened when things have gone wrong, British cycling, for example, if you think about football coaches and abuse, when things go wrong, they go horribly wrong in sport, and that's why it's so important to, um, to ensure that we have things in place to uh, protect ourselves. There's also a UK code of governance. Um, this was developed by UK Sport and Sport England. I was fortunate to be on the board of UK Sport at the time, so I was able to contribute to, to that in some degree as well. I'm also proud that it followed a lot of the principles of what we'd already done in Wales to show that Wales was leading the way on this, particularly around behaviours um, and ethics. Uh, UK Sports and Sports England has tended to be far more driven by the funding climate, actually, and by the protocols around how they distribute public money, which for me is probably not the best starting point when you look at a, um, a framework for governance. It's far more important to get the ethics and the principles right than it is to um, think about the... Uh, um, how you fund organisations um, out there. Both the Welsh and the UK frameworks um, use fairly similar principles, and these underpin the code. That ours are much more values driven, I think, values driven, I think, than the English version. Let me just take you through a couple of those um, here, which I think are important to how sport should be governed. Um, integrity, first of all, this is a this is a really important and fundamental principle. Um, and I hope this doesn't sound too critical for those of you who are, are working in sport currently. But I think historically there's been a certain kind of arrogance about sport and an insularity. <laughs> Two things have fed off each other, by the way. 
There's a feeling that somehow sport can be isolated from contextual and societal realities, that we're in some respects different and better, and we're not. And this is really very, very important. If you look at how sexism has continued to exist in sport, and has been tolerated in some circles until very recently, if you look at homophobia in sport, <coughs> racism, a uh, lot of you will follow the Raheem Sterling um, incident recently. These are very, very transient issues in sport. Um, bribery, doping, I could go on if I wanted to be negative, but, but, but I don't want to be negative because I think sport is in the business now of sorting itself out. Um, aside from the public funding and the duty to um, distribute funding properly, there's also a responsibility to be transparent and well run. The, the fact that we receive funding from uh, government and other organisations puts on us an extra duty actually to be um, properly run. So that's the integrity part. Um, there's also the issue of challenge and pluralism. I think it's the role of leaders in sport to, to invite alternative standpoints to what they do. Um, I don't think we've had strong enough leaders across the sector. I think there's a certain kind of coziness about sports leadership where people um, allow the same things to happen that have happened traditionally. Um, and the, as the old saying goes, then you know what you will get, which will be what you've always got. Um, we need that kind of critical edginess, that friction in the governance of sport to allow us um, to move to a different level. And of course, what's that, what that's about in terms of board behaviours is a proper culture of scrutiny at every opportunity. If you have board members who are relaxed about scrutiny and an executive who accepts scrutiny in the right spirit, then the chances are you will continue to improve as an organisation. One chief exec of a board on which I've served told me once when I was engaging on admittedly a quite tough uh, exercise of scrutiny of a strategy we were working on, he said to me, your problem, Laura, is that you always want more. You forget how far we've come. Now again, think about the irony of that. A sports organisation, like an athlete, should always be looking at the next tournament, the next match, the next game, the next challenge. If you look constantly back at your successes, if you look in your medal cabinet or your tro at your trophies and say, I've made it, then the chances are you'll stagnate, if not go backwards. So these are really important principles about how you approach board membership uh, when you are involved as well. As I said, an effective board should not be a cosy club. It should not be close to new people and new ideas. It should be uh, a, a, an edgy place. Um, there's a fabulous Leonard Cohen song, um, which I think has created the spin-off to the Hay Festival, which says, um, there's a crack in everything and that's where the light gets in. I'm paraphrasing here, by the way, the actual lyrics. But that's a quite important principle. The cracks where you challenge and where you force a fissure in an uh, organisation's thinking are usually where the next step to progress happens. And I think that's very, very fundamental. If I may, I'm going to go back to a slide that I skated over because I think there's a really important principle around diversity which I want to refer to. <coughs> those, are the, those are the things which have always focused my mind when I'm involved with, um, uh, when I'm involved with sports governance. Um, if you take that one about propriety and ambition, as I said a moment ago, what, why is it so important? Well, there's a really basic thing here, which won't be a surprise to any of you in this room, which is that volunteers run sport. Lots of you may work in sport <coughs> and your salary from sport, uh, but at most levels, and in the vast majority, it's volunteers that run sport. Um, they're not being paid, they're giving up their time voluntarily, so we need to protect them and we need to respect them. Um, I'm afraid at times we don't do effective due diligence on some of the people that are involved in sport. And some of the issues that we've faced as a sector has come from the lack of research and preparation that we've done around key people. Why does that happen? Um, again, I'm going to be very careful about what I say here because you might be guess which organisation I'm referring to. Um, new types of leaders in sport can be very seductive, particularly to government. If somebody comes in without a conventional background in sport, 
but talks a lot about renewal and innovation and change without any history of having done that kind of work, then often there's an attraction to that person because they're speaking in a different language and a different tone. Now, if I'm being unkind, and I, I hesitate to say this, Rachel's here from the business school and lots of other people here, it's almost like hearing somebody recite a kind of management textbook with all of the buzzwords around innovation and management and uh, strategy and direction, vision and so on. So they can talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk. They've never done anything in sport, they don't know anything about sport, and more importantly, they don't have that kind of emotional commitment to all that we're doing. And I'm afraid the progress we've made in sport is very fragile. Um, sometimes we've pushed an organisation forward, whether that's a governing body, Sport Wales, um, a club, and then we find ourselves being dragged back by the wrong appointment. So appointment to leadership positions is absolutely fundamental, um, and we need to take that a lot more seriously than we have done um, to date. I wanted to say something about diversity as well, not just because it's an important um, topic to me, but because it's something that I don't think up until now sport has taken seriously enough. Um, there's a very good US academic who's written a lot about diversity in a general sense. I mean, lots of you will know of Margaret Heffernan. I mean, she talks in her own research around the Enron crisis, which of course was a great example of the board um, failing. She talks about willful blindness. And that's a really important concept because what often happens on boards is that people willfully overlook things that are not going well or are, go uh, or are going badly. Um, and if you have a board that looks and feels like each other, or if its members are from similar backgrounds, whether that's sport, or whether they're all male, or whether they're all white, and whether they're all of a certain age group, or all of those things put together, then the chances are there will be a lot of blind spots on that board. And equally, it might not be willful all the time, but they will miss some important developments um, around that organisation. So that's why diversity is important. There's also a re another really interesting book that I read recently called The Diversity Bonus uh, by a, a chap called Scott Page from Mi Michigan <coughs> University. And he's talking there not about representational diversity, which is what you all know about in sports. You know, how do we get more women onto boards? How do we get people from black, black and minority ethnic backgrounds, disabled people, and so on? He doesn't talk about that. He talks about cognitive diversity. And he talks about how by creating representational diversity, that is a mixed board with, that looks and feels different, you get more um, uh, different algorithms, you get different perspectives, and in turn that creates a, a very creative and successful organisation. I think that applies to sports governance more than any other sector um, at the moment. And by the way, I was pleased to see Sport Wales stick its neck out on diversity. And um, it, I think it's, re correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm removed from it now, but I think the new policy position is that all major uh, national governing bodies must move to 50% um, female boards by 2020, or at least have plans to do so. That, by the way, is more aspirational than the operating in India, which has adopted a 30% target um, as part of their code of governance. Um, why is that important? Well, I think it is a stepping stone to creating stronger national governing bodies that can represent their, um, uh, their constituencies much better than they currently do. Okay, on to the more interesting bits now, some pictures. <coughs> okay, what's this one? Now, I don't, don't think anybody's going to identify the people in this room or uh, in this picture. I'll be surprised if you do, but it's an interesting one. And I put it up because it's a, a photographic illustration um, of progress that's been made. Um, now, I was involved in the first part of a visit to the Football Association back in 1993 as a, a group of people who were lobbying, or three women in fact, who were lobbying to encourage the FAW to take on responsibility for um, the women's team. This goes back quite a long way before this. This is a picture from 1971. And the reason it's important, the reason I put it up to show the progress that can be made through changes in governance, is this is when, or was at the time, when Rule 34 was repealed. And those of you who know about football will know that Rule 34 was a rule that had banned women from playing on any affiliated grounds and pitches in both England through the FA and in Wales through the FAW. Now that existed from 1921 to 1971. Can you believe it? 
it was so significant because it actually banned anybody involved in football from supporting women's football. And of course, every involved in football was male because women hadn't had any foothold in the game. It was based on a 1920s phenomenon of the game being unsuitable for girls and women. But you know, it took until 1971 for this to be changed. That picture, by the way, uh, shows officers from the North Wales Coast FA uh, being lobbied by female players from Cristati Ladies Football Club about changing the rule a year before it actually changed. Really very, very important to see how recent some of the bad practice in sport actually is. So on to this one. Um, this is the uh, UEFA Women's Strategy Group. I'm part of that, as you can see, as is a lovely seven-month-old baby who's the child of the vice president of the Finnish FA, who's sitting there. The reason I'm putting that up is a group, that, a group of us who've been working on the new women's football strategy um, in UEFA. The reason I, pu I put it up is because you can see there that of that group, um, some 25 uh, years later, after we lobbied the FAW for change, there are four men and 11 women working on that strategy. Lots of women in really important leadership roles, lots of men in really important leadership roles. One of the, the chaps there is the director of, um, the sporting director of Juventus, um, one of them is the manager of the Danish women's football team, and one of them is the football association in England's head of the professional game. Um, all very, very important, but it shows that women are now taking their rightful place in governing their sport. But it's taken us a long time to get there, and I don't think we can afford to be as slow in terms of progress as we have been um, up until this point. So another quick picture to show progress. That's me, um, a very young me, lifting the Welsh Women's Cup uh, at the final that was held at the old National Stadium. And the Arms Park back in um, 1995, alongside the Arms Park, I should say, back in 1995, when the game really had very little recognition and very little attention in the media. That's the first well, official Welsh women's uh, team playing our first qualifiers. Prize if you spot me in that, because it's not a great picture. Um, when we went to Croatia as part of the um, World Cup qualifying campaign back in 1994. And that was just after the Welsh FA, and all credit to Alan Evans, the former honorary secretary and chief exec of the um, FAW, for embracing the challenge that we set him, which was to take on um, Welsh women's football and to run with it. So this one, very, very important. Some of you will recognise some of those figures there. In the top, um, you'll see Jess Fishlock, Sophie Ingle, um, all plying their trade now as professional women players, so earning a salary from the game, just out in Lyon, and obviously on loan at Lyon, one of the best clubs in the world, but playing out in the US. Um, and, and most of the Welsh players, the top Welsh players, playing in the professional women's Super League over the border in England. And the bottom one, you'll know Jane Ludlow, our own national team manager, with Phil Neville, multi cap England international, now manages the England women's team. Who would have thought that we'd come this far, really, in terms of uh, the women's game? The, re the reason I put those <coughs> slides up is to show that this isn't all negative, that lots of things are happening, that there's a <coughs> positivity about the speed of governance as well, but also because success can actually challenge us on governance too. And I think about the game when we played England last August in uh, Rodney Parade in Newport, which was the effectively the qualification decider. Unfortunately, we lost to England, they were out to qualify, we didn't. But up until that point, we hadn't lost a game in the qualifying group, and we hadn't conceded a goal. Great position to be in for a small nation. But more important in some regards for what happens next, is that in the coverage of the game, three really important issues came to the fore. Equal pay for male and female players, Lack of diversity on the Football Association of Wales Board and the FAW Trust Board, and I sit on the board so I can be suitably self critical here. Um, and the proportion spend on girls and men's, girls and boys, men's and women's football in Wales. So, through a successful event came a discussion of important governance principles, and I think that shows where opportunities lie um, for us to uh, advance, advance things further. Okay, just to close then, because I think I've probably used up as much time as I should, um, let me just reiterate some of the points I've made. There are a whole set of principles that anybody can pick up on good governance in sport. They are transferable to any sector, by the way. 
I wouldn't make a claim for a moment that sport is unique in terms of these principles of integrity, accountability, diversity, and so on. But because sport matters so much, particularly to the Welsh people, who feel it is a really fundamental part of their identity and their profile, I think we have to get it right in Wales. We cannot afford to uh, uh, create risks. We cannot afford to have scandals in sport that undermine uh, all of the good work that's going on. So I believe very strongly that um, all of our progress in sport has to be um, underpinned by the security of really good governance foundations. Safeguarding, of course, risk avoidance, public accountability. And there have to be those kind of frameworks that we've talked about, the structures and processes and articles and so on. They're, they're fundamental, but more important is that they must be overlaid with ambitious leadership. And ambitious leaders have to be open to development and criticism. They have to be, they have to welcome challenge, they have to embrace friction, they have to be open to all of those things, or we will not make the kind of progress that I've illustrated um, in those photos a moment ago. And if we can couple that with a real clarity of vision of where we want sport to be, I mean, that's Sport Wales' job, in effect, but Sport Wales is only as strong as all of you who work in sport and all of those people out there um, who do the hard work on the playing fields and in the clubs. If we can couple that with a really ambitious vision um, for what we're trying to do in sport, um, as well as the drive and energy, then I think sport um, can be there for us at every stage of our lives and, and whatever our ability. The bottom line is, Sport is important. I said to you earlier, it's important because it isn't important. It's important. It's an extremely valuable public good. And I believe more than anything that if we can get the governance right, if we can improve our governance and strengthen it, then it can continue to flourish and be something that everybody will have in every <coughs> community, in every part of the world. <laughs> So uh, we'll give Laura just a couple of seconds to <coughs> draw breath and while uh, you uh, raise some, some questions and comments. comments. So we'll take a couple and then we'll ask Laura to respond. Would you like to go first? Kate. Hi, Laura. So it's Kate from the Welsh Sports Association. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people outside of sport. <coughs> Yeah, so a really good question. It's, it's been a thorny issue for us, hasn't it, for a long time. You know, how do we persuade all of the talent that there is out there that sport is a good place for them to give up the time that we need, really? Um, I think there's a few things we can do. Um, I think we can show that we're ambitious and that we're changing. Um, I, I would be reluctant to, to encourage talented people to go to organisations that won't match their ambition. So I think we have to raise our game in the first instance, which of course is part of the work that what our sports association is doing and, and sport world itself. So I think we have to raise the game so that all of the national government bodies, all of the organisations, whether they're charities or clubs, um, are positioned well and are professionally run so that they are attractive to professional people. Because I don't think we can expect volunteers to come and throw their weight behind our sector and the things that motivate us unless we can show them that we have proper propriety and proper ambitions for the sector. So I think that's one thing. I think the diversity point comes into play again there because at the moment we've been cast in a net in a pretty shallow pool um, in terms of how we recruit people to sport. So I think one of the things that I was most proud of when I was chair of sport was how we transformed the board membership really. I mean, I, just for those of you who don't know, when I took over as chair of sport, whereas the board was almost 80% male, which is not, well, it is a problem in itself, let's, let's not be too over the bush. It's a problem in itself because it's likely to be quite uniform in its outlook and so on. They were very good individuals, by the way, that's why I hesitated, because they were very good men, all of them who were really committed to you know, doing good work in sport. But, but they couldn't reassure me that they were close enough to all the areas of our strategic influence to be able to scrutinise and challenge properly. Um, so through a quite painful process, it was painful because I had to go by the Welsh Government, um, and um, that was difficult because the public appointments process that the Welsh Government runs is simply not fit for purpose. I say that in this environment because I said it directly to Welsh Government um, as part of my sign off from being chair of Sport Wales. It, it tends to recruit a very conservative, uh, small C um, environment of, of individuals. 
So it was quite a hard process, but, but over a period of three years, we managed to create a board that was much more in tune with what our work was. So it ended up being, I think, 60% female, around 18% black and minority ethnic. Um, more importantly for me, the age range was different. So we had a lot of people who were young parents, um, not a lot of people, some board members were young parents. Um, and going back to my slide about how important school sport is and introduction to <coughs> sport, I wanted to, I wanted to be sure that we were having some input from people who were very close to the school environment and so on. So I think diversity comes into play as well in terms of how you recruit. And I think sport needs to be less insular you know, in terms of how they judge people's contributions who are coming and offering their services. They may not have a background in taekwondo or badminton or boxing or football, um, but they may bring something really important to the table. And it's, it's incredibly important that we don't have governing bodies run exclusively by people who have been involved in that sport. We need them in the mix, of course, but we also need people who can judge things with perhaps a more dispassionate eye. Okay. Next. I'm James, James Hall, I'm a project manager for people who work. We, we run a, a project, search engine project called Play Against Sport, which we sign for sports based, uh, based in London. Um, the profits are used to help run uh, inter schools, sports projects, and other activities in the area. Um, we've been amazed, we've had um, about 150 children at the time coming from eight or nine schools in the Longwood area, playing in sports, on different sports pitches um, in the Longwood and Pockwood areas. Uh, and a lot of those teachers who come um, have told us that their schools are not involved in inter-school sporting activities. Or if they have, they send elite children, or those in sort of form, they've already established rugby and football players usually to such events. Um, we've been amazed how excited primary school children have been to get involved in a, a, a range of sporting activity, going out for the day, enjoying it, participating, not all about the winning, but actually having a good time and wearing a school jersey if they've got one. Some schools don't even have a, any school um, sports strip at all, um, and we are involved in trying to help that. Uh, we're doing this on a shoestring, um, and what amazes us is how little activity there is going on between uh, schools in this area, and how often we, when people say sport, they need, they're simply looking at the, at the elite level. Uh, 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 and the elite level is a, a tiny fraction. But a lot of us who are active um, and want to be involved in sport, I started playing football at 50, for instance, um, and I, I'm not going to be Gareth Bale, but I enjoy playing. Mm -hmm. and, and that whole thing of engaging people in the sense is a good activity, a fine activity. The other thing I have noticed to say is, is on mental health. So I'm also, my volunteering time, manager uh, um, a group of young men in a football team here in Carnia, um, and I'm the secretary and the chair and the manager. Um, a lot of the guys I've dealt with over the last year have confided in me about some mental health issues and the pressure that young men are under in the current society. Not quite sure who they are, some are professional people. Um, and it really concerns me that, that uh, but it also concerns me that the football team is, is a really important thing for those young men um, developing relationships and, and developing support. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're to all of that, really. And <coughs> just the only point I'd make, really, is how important schools are as a site for sport. Um, and we're not getting that right without a shadow of a doubt. You know, I don't think we're getting it right in terms of early years. Um, you know, I've got, I've got two young daughters, and the, the, the truth of the matter is that by the age of five, if, if a girl's had a at that age has had a negative experience of taking part in sport, then it will be extremely hard to get her back into the frame. Different for boys, by the way, because opportunities are more diverse, <coughs> excuse me, and dispersed. So I think you know, some of the work that we're doing in football now about the earliest interventions, you know, I mean, I know I've been banged a drum on this for a long time. If I was doing a new strategy for girls' football, it would be preschool based, <coughs> as simple as that. Because girls, by the time they enter school, have already been put off football boys will have been encouraged to do football. So you know, by the time they're seven, eight, nine, it's too late to learn. And, and it goes back to my point about physical education as well. You know, people have um, very uh, limited appraisals of what physical education is, usually based on our own experiences, which could be positive or negative. 
But the truth of the matter is, you know, phys physical education and physical literacy journey is about the skills of being physically active throughout life. You know, it's about basic skills like balance and coordination and catching throwing a ball and you know using one, one's own physical well-being to be active. Um, I, I think that's more important than virtually anything, and, and it, even alongside numeracy and literacy, because those are things that when they when we put them together, create a healthy, active, <coughs> engaged citizen. And we're not getting that right at the moment. So I think sport has to tackle some of the education agenda more powerfully if we're going to achieve what we would like to achieve. And just sort of before we move on to the next question, what, what then uh, is the new curriculum? And the uh, the area of learning experience in which physical literacy would sit is that mainly opportunity, or is there a, a risk in there as as well? Well, well both, I guess. I mean, you know, people in the room are probably more up to date than me, me on this, but I follow the interest because it's something that I, I regard as so strategically important. But the Donaldson curriculum, which, as you know, has been um, plans for its implementation are being worked on at the moment. You know, there is one of the themes around healthy. Uh, healthy well-being, uh, around health and well-being, and creating uh, young people who are um, active and so on. But the, the problem is, until there is some protection around physical education and physical activity within the curriculum, the chances are that it will always be squeezed out by the things which are properly inspected by ESTIN. Um, and, and that's what worries me, that if we don't have the status, um, the appropriate status for PE, um, it will still be regarded as a Cinderella subject and one that is cancelled when there's a school, I start board or concert as it is in my daughter's school and I, will, I raise that every opportunity with a head teacher. But you know, these are really important things, you know. Um, uh, it, however important culture, singing, music, theatre, drama is, sport is fundamental to the health of the nation. And if we are not giving children the skills to be active for life, then we're actually um, creating um, a huge rod for our own backs further down the line. So whilst I'm optimistic that the rollout of dogs and offer opportunities, unless there's a change in mindset alongside that, then I'm afraid schools will still find ways of bypassing these really important principles. Okay, and there's a colleague at the back. Uh, my name is Nicholas Todd. Um, in light of the recent judgment related to Jess Barney, how do the arguments put forward by the UK Sports and British Cycling that they have no agreement or contract with an athlete who's funded by them, and therefore little or no accountability or ability for the athlete to challenge the NGV or UK Sport fit into good governance of sport? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. I followed that case, Jess Barney, with some, you know, some interest. Uh, particularly because of some of her accusations against um, the funding bodies. Um, it's, it's very technical, and I, I don't want to lose people here, you know, because this is a hugely technical area. Um, but effectively, you know, athletes are funded by the governing body, which in turn is, is, is fund elite athletes, which are, in turn is funded by UK Sport. Um, the issue is over their status, of, their legal status of their employment, you know, whether they're self-employed or whether they're effectively employed and should therefore have benefits like pension, protection, um, uh, you know, uh, codes of discipline and so on. Um, and we know that the court ruled against um, Jess last week. Um, I'm not going to go into the legal aspects of that, first, first and foremost because I'm not a lawyer and they're very technical, but I think there are some important principles underlying that. I think, I think we need to do a lot more around duty of care to athletes who are funded. Um, we know this in Wales where um, some of our really top athletes fell out of the UK um, funding support scheme because they've been injured, for example. And on often weird sport where we pick them up and um, get them back into the um, saddle or into the pool or whatever it was. Um, because, of course, we're talking about individuals' lives here. Um, the rhythms of being an athlete are determined by illness and injury as much as they are by, by sports. <coughs> Um, so it's a you know it's it's a very important principle, but but at the bottom of it, you know, it's our duty to have regard for what are always young people by the nature of sport. Um, often young people who haven't done anything else in their lives because they've been talented sports people from a very young age, so they might not have the hinterland of professional experience to be able to challenge things that are going on around them. And I think this, unfortunately, and this is it is a criticism of UK sport. 
there's been um, more emphasis on the end product, which is the medal, than there is on the process and the regard for the athlete during that journey. And I think it, at the very least, that this has to be a big wake up call to um, the governing bodies and the overarching funding agency to put more attention on the athlete to make him or her the centre of the concern. Okay. Coming over here. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I work in banking. I'm a corporate banker in South Wales, and I'm a massive believer in the strength of the infrastructure. So you've got to have a good road, rail, airport links. You've got to have strong education, strong universities, and that those are the basis for building a stronger South Wales economy. Uh, I also, in my part time, run a football club and sit on the local football league, the South Wales FA. <coughs> I totally agree with everything said so far and I've seen schools virtually pull out of sort of sport uh, but the big problem is we haven't got the infrastructure in football uh, and I'm sure it's the same in all sports I'm in negotiations with the local council because they want to stop uh, the maintenance of all the football pitches and everything I have parents on to me all the time saying that I've got a responsibility to provide sport for their for their children. But it comes down to a very basic level. I would love to see all the governance that you've talked about because it is old men mm. running football, if I'm being hypercritical, who were there for well, the... You're being, you're being accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, let's, be, let's be honest about this. You know, we, And I, I speak from somebody involved in football. That's accurate, not yeah. critical. But, but it comes down to a basic level. So I live in Cowbridge, so my parents are quite wealthy, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, and I've been quoted on the BBC as saying it, but you're going to see if you're going to increase the costs and everything, there, there is a major problem in very, very grassroots sport coming through from the younger level. The schools aren't going to do it. With the governance as well, which is very difficult for volunteers, and I tr I'm a great believer of getting you know, strong people, but we're totally reliant on that, and it's killing sport. And I don't know what the answer is. No. You know, I spoke to Alan Cairns, and yeah, he yeah. says, what can I do? Well, put some, I mean, put some money I'm glad you're speaking to politicians, by the way. I mean, Alan Cairns is, is one of the ones you should speak to, but you should also speak to your, your councillor. Really important role for local authorities. You make the decisions over pitch fees, for example, <coughs> and access to pitches, and maintenance. But you should also speak to your assembly members, you know, because my point of criticism earlier on was that assembly members, um, and especially ministers, like some of the glory that's attached to sport, but they're less enthusiastic about putting their hands in their pockets to uh, allow athletes to come through the system, you know, because pe people like Aaron Ramsey or Sam Warburton or Becky James in cycling, they don't just appear, you know. Somebody has taught them in school, somebody's helped their development, you know, at grassroots level through a club. Um, and it's not just not acceptable for politicians to, you know, bask in the glory of the top end without being prepared to work at the um, bottom end. But one thing I will say, and you're absolutely right about infrastructure, the biggest weakness we have in sport in Wales is facilities, um, and especially outdoor facilities for, for football and rugby, you know, because th things have changed societally as well. I mean, if you, you know anything, well, you'd know from corporate banking, you know, everybody, everybody these days does futurology studies to look at what the world will look like in 10, 15, 20 years' time. And we've been poorer in, uh, in that respect in sport, in all honesty, because there's been lots of studies, but not so much action around them. Technology will take over sport. I mean, I'm not going off track here, but technology will take over sport, as will a much more casual approach to play in. You know, because people have different lifestyles now. In the days when we'd all sign up for a club, and play, you know, 11 side football or 15 side rugby. People want to drop in and out now with their families and do things casually and not commit to something for a long time. You know, they want to be able to, you know, dip in and out of sport. And I don't think sports governing bodies have got their heads around that. Fundamental point about facilities, though. Um, I mean, I think things are starting to move. I think the penny's dropped in, in government now that we, if we don't do something, we will have a whole army of children who want to do sport but haven't got a, pe a place to play. Um, you know, uh, artificial pitches are really important in that regard, obviously, because our weather in Wales is not great for grass pitches. Um, really fundamental that we use the education <coughs> infrastructure as well. So when new schools are built, 
um, that they incorporate good sports facilities that are open to the public outside school hours alongside 21st century schools are doing that in some respects but they haven't done it uniformly um, so all of those things do require lobbying you know and, and nothing frustrates me more than when local authorities um, wash their hands of, of sporting facilities or contract them out without, without any safeguards for ensuring that everybody has access to them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're getting close to the end. There's a colleague here, and what we'll do, Laura, if it's okay with you, we'll see if there are if there are another two or three yeah, questions. We'll take them as a yeah, you can deal with the lot, and then we'll close. So we'll take this colleague here, and then if there's anyone else who wants to get in, indicate, and we'll, we'll take them first. <coughs> I really enjoyed your piece today, Laura. Um, Neil, and I've, so my day job is the Public Group Housing Association, but I'm on the board of Street Football Wales, which is Wales's homeless football charity. A uh, slight plug for the fact that I haven't saw a car this summer. It's a major event you probably haven't heard of yet, but it is coming, so we'll have 50, 60 odd teams from around the world coming in. And that's a, a side of the game which I think grassroots is quite what you call it, but that's people who have lived incredibly difficult lives. We'll see Wales and a, a Wales men's and women's team competing this year, representing their country, wearing a Wales shirt, and really overcoming amazing challenges to get to a point of, of huge pride in their lives and, and, and a turning point really for all the players involved in the tournament from all over the world. Um, we've had some great support from the sport world. It's sometimes difficult to get people to engage, but I, I often wonder whether the way we talk about sport, not just in Wales, but the way the sports infrastructure governance is framed, the language we use, and the language of elites. Mm -hmm. Elite versus what? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I say that as someone who's always been out of sport myself. You know, you, you look up at the, the elite game, and you think, these aren't elite people, these are just people who are professional sports players. You wouldn't say to someone who, who worked in any other professional environment that they weren't elite because they weren't, you know, the best shelf stacker or the best factory operative or the best banker or the best housing so you know housing professional. I don't know how helpful that language is and I don't know how how effectively it actually binds the game. Mm -hmm. And I wonder as a challenge to someone involved in governance at the highest level, what responsibility is there on sports funding bodies, on sports bodies, to actually disentangle some of that and to reframe the way we think about the funding of sport because there is so much money. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's, let's have another couple of very quick questions. If there are any, one here, that last one, and one here. <coughs> then that. Hi, Laura. Uh, Thanks, and folks uh, involved in a uh, tennis club, chair of a tennis club in Penarth. Um, the culture of tennis has changed. It's volunteer uh, led, <coughs> volunteer committees. Um, we change our committee once a year, and you have a three-year term on the committee, which follows in a lot of what you've been saying. Big problem is trying to recruit people to join onto the committee. One of the bugbears people have is the amount of governance that we've been introducing because we're following good and best practice, and people want to get involved in the fun little bits, but they don't. They get bored and bogged down by this. <coughs> um, we then have recruited someone, unfortunately. From what you've been saying, it is an elderly gentleman who's come onto it, and he's a classic sort of. I've been on a hundred committees in my life. My question is, how do we encourage the younger parents, the younger females, the younger mums to get involved onto committees but in a voluntary capacity? Super, thank you. And the last one here, very briefly, please. <coughs> Thanks. Do um, more that, Laura. Um, Stuart Hill, the University of South Wales. Um, I like your point about leadership. And the way in which we choose leaders, because it happens clearly in sport, it happens in my area of transport, where um, on the one hand you have a person who is appointed um, because they're a safe pair of hands, a um, person who is appointed because they come up with words like transformational, um, change is a good thing, all the kind of words that we've all heard. But very often they have no experience in that area. Um, I don't understand many of the issues which have been <coughs> considered over the years. But then on the other side, we have maybe somebody who's appointed, who's been in the in the whatever business it is, like sport, for a long time, and therefore are almost equally negative in terms of, oh, we did that before, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's how do we find this balanced leader uh, between those two of experience and new ideas? Yeah, really good question. Take those two entities and Stuarts together if I can, because there's a relationship there. 
Um, you know, I suppose I should say nobody said this was easy. You know, because when we tried to reform the board of sport, it, was, it took us quite a long time to get the right people. You know, and there was a lot of powers of persuasion. You know, where I'd sort of go and spend a lot of time talking to people who were skeptical about what they would get from it personally, and and the contribution and the exposure to potential criticism and so on. But I think you can persuade people if you show them what the outcomes can be. You know, particularly parents, actually, because you know, if you, we all we all want our children to have the best opportunities, don't we? And to you know, experience things that either we experience as children, or even better that we we experience as children. So I think that's always a really powerful in. There's lots of ways of incentivizing um, people to get involved with boards as well. You know, because um, as, as Stuart, I think you said the elderly gentleman who came in. You know, I don't want to be ageist at all about this because we need people with experience on boards. You know, we need people who've got time. And if you're retired, the chances are you've got more time to do some of the administration around boards. What we don't need is 11 elderly gentlemen on a board or 10 elderly gentlemen. You know, or elderly women for that matter. You know, what we want is a mix of, of uh, profiles and experiences and backgrounds and so on. Not easy, but you can incentivise it as well because the sexy bits of sports sometimes you know you can dangle them chance of a ticket for Wimbledon in your case or whatever it is to encourage people to, to be involved. But I think it's outcome based for me, you know, it's seeing the happiness of a group of four year olds who pick up a racket for the first time and the pleasure that they get from hitting the ball and so on. But it's not easy, I accept that. And, and it relates to your point, Stuart, about, um, about leadership. Um, I think we've got to, rather than expect all of that in one individual, I think we've got to do a few things. We've got to first of all guard against the charlatans in sport. Um, and you know, I, I genuinely believe this because I've come across quite a few of them. There are some pretty dodgy individuals who um, who come to the surface in sport because sport is so you know attractive to everybody, um, and and they're in it for the wrong reasons. You know, they're patently in it to, for their own ends rather than for the benefit of the community or the organisation. We need to wise up on that. You know, I think we've been incredibly naive with some recent appointments in in that area and allowed organisations to be. Uh, dragged through the, the gutter really as a result and that's unforgivable so that's the first thing the second thing is i think we've got to expect those attributes in different people on the board everybody's a leader on a small board you know it's not just the chair um, or, the, or the vice chair you know I, I would expect whoever of the 10 members on the board to have a real leadership role in certain aspects of what they do so they may be old heads, you know, but then next to them will be a board member for whom it's the first time they've actually sat on a board, somebody with L plates, because they're the ones that ask the toughest questions, you know, because they're approaching very cold. They've got no hinterland, no background, they just ask it as it is. And you always want somebody with L plates on your board, I think. You know, it's really very important. And your, your point, I mean, Homeless World Cup is a really great initiative, and I'm glad the FAW is involved with it, and I think we all need to get behind that. Because you know, it, it exemplifies the mental health benefits of sport as much as, as yeah. and social benefits of sport as much as anything. Interesting point you made about language, you know, because I'm guilty of that as well. I've used terms here, you know, which um, are very much, you know, in that mode. Um, but you're right, we do need to think about the language we use, uh, and that's a part of diversity anyway. You know, if we're if we're offering exclusionary language, the chances are we're not making our product attractive to to people out there. So maybe we need to step back and say which aspects of how we've always done things and always communicated things in sport. I'm looking at some of the guys at the back who are working in that environment, so-called high performance elite and, and so on. Maybe we do need to reverse a different language that allows the journey through sport to be more seamless. Not everybody will reach the top. Is that exclusionary? I don't know. But you know, not everybody will get to be the top international athlete. But well, one thing you can be sure of, there will, there's a role for everybody in sport, and you can enjoy sport as much if you're not good at, as good at it as if you're really brilliant at it. And that's the message we need to get out there to everybody if we're serious about health and so on. Brilliant. No, thanks so much. It's been a, a magisterial uh, sweep, and you know the, the, the experience and, uh, and insight you've drawn has been uh, tremendous. So, could we thank Laura and... <laughs>